Christ. We have all of history, all of those saints that have gone before us said He never failed. And we have a record of those who will come after us as if they've already come. Because today, tomorrow, the next day, are all the same to the Lord. He sees them as if they've already taken place. And he, he hasn't failed any of them either. Right? So it's not yet. He will never fail. We don't need to have children's church this morning. Uh, unless, of course, Delby, you want to go and, and pray so you, uh, you guys are too old for that. So would you stay right here? If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy this morning. And uh, I promise you, well, I don't know what I say. I promise to keep it short. Ah, you know, we may be here the rest of the afternoon. Do you guys have lunch plans? Somebody call Domino's. Give them on the line. Get yeah. Domino's to deliver in about three hours. It's a little bit. Today's message. It will be brief. But don't take that to mean it will be less than powerful. This is the word of the Lord. My message today from the Lord is the importance of that needs to be placed on the Word of God. The Word of God in serving the God of His Word in accordance with His will through His Word. So the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. You know, I, I talk to people sometimes outside of church that are here for church, and they tell me, you know, you put a lot of emphasis on the Word. Well, you know, like that song that J.J., introduced a few weeks back now, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't want to get up here and talk about me or tell jokes or, or say things that, wow, that's so memorable that I'll remember Pastor Timothy a long time after he's gone and I'll be looking up there at J.J. maybe or some other young guy thinking, boy, I remember when Pastor, no. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about him. His word, and I cannot emphasize enough, but I'm going to try this morning to emphasize how important the word of God is. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4.13. Until I come, Paul says, until I come, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. Now, the other day, now I've been here coming on 11 years now, and last year, only, as far as I remember, if I'm wrong, somebody raise your hand a minute and tell me. Last year, I got up, because it was the day before New Year, and read to you the passages as if you were going to go through the Scriptures this year with us, 2018, if you were going to go all the way through the Bible with that Bible plan, that Bible reading plan that we published, and we publish every year. If you were going to go through, I preempted and read all of the first days, all of the passages, first, second, third uh, Genesis, and the first chapter of Matthew for you. So you're already ahead, you're already started, you've begun the new year off right. Now all you've got to do is pick up from there and keep up with it. As far as I know, that's the only time I've ever done that, is read the, the scriptures for you for those particular passages. And my daughter says to me the other day, she says, so daddy, are you just going to get up there and start us off right for the new year and read Gen Like you always do. Now, how many of you know, anytime someone says always or never, you know, in an argument, in an argument, husbands and wives, when you say always and never, you're already wrong. They don't always do that. They don't never do that. I don't always. Huh? Literally. Literally. They keep me going, not only on Sunday, the rest of the week. So I'm not going to read to you two days from now it's passages. I'm going to encourage you to pick up this year. If you failed in 18, but just by a little bit, you know, you got a day off. The rest of the day, today, you got probably tomorrow off. Catch up. If you're too far, maybe it'd be discouraging to even try to catch up. Just start. January 1, with us. Many of us. I think the first year I asked, and there was just, just a few people that, that raised their hand that went all the way through the Scriptures in a year with us. Second year it increased, and it's been increasing every year, and it's just so important 
that we do that. It's so important that we do public reading of scriptures, teaching and preaching as well. In 1 Timothy 4.13, it says, Devote yourself to public reading of scriptures, preaching, and teaching. In Romans, Paul tells us, Romans 1.15, follow me, it says, That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you. And that's anyone. Paul was specifically referring to those in Rome in this passage, but it's, he's so eager, he, he always wanted to present the gospel. For he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Go figure that the word of God would reveal the God of the Word. Amen? It's His Word. And He has put it out there for us. Multiple writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a couple of thousand years, almost 2,000 or 1,500 plus years, all of it culminating in one single message. A message from God to the people that He plans to bring with Him all the way to the end. Amen? Amen. The, the Word of God, it says here in verse 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Well, let me tell you just very, very quickly today how that played out realistically, literally, guys, in my life. I come in here, of course, you imagine, you know, it's 4 a.m., the lights are off and it's dark. If we turn the lights off right now, it would be dark. But when I came in about 4 a.m., the, the lights are off and it's dark. So I scurry up, thank you. I scurry up here, you know, to find the stairs. And we moved them a couple weeks ago. They used to be together, now they're separated, you know, so I'm trying to take a big leap up here. But I found my way to up here because I, I start up here. Because I start my prayer as a priestess. I start my prayer first in a position. Asking our Father for His blessings on this place and this people. And then many times when I'm just praying for myself and praying my own petitions, I'm just pacing down these aisles. But I start up here. And I'd already read my today's readings. Who, who can tell me where the readings for today are? If you're reading through the scriptures on our plan, you would have been reading the 13th and 14th chapter of Zechariah and the uh, 24th first chapter of Revelation. Now I went ahead, I read all of Zechariah earlier this week, but then I went back and started to read each day's portion, each day as well. And today I read 13 and 14, but man, it's the very last book, Malachi. So I said, well, I've got to read it as well. And I'm up here, and, and, and you know, these guys have all kinds of things. And by the way, oh, what a beautiful worship time. The Madagascan wave. I remember when the first wave from Madagascar came. They hardly knew English. Now, Mama did, because she's working for the World Bank. She's got to, you know, communicate with people all over. But the kids, man, I heard more clicks that, that were supposed to be words or something than, than articulate words that I could understand, you know? I mean, they came, and then the second wave they came. Of course, they, they came already playing instruments and, and praising the Lord and all that. But, but the early wave could barely speak English. And look. Our entire worship service was the Madagascans and Kim. The Madagascans and Kim brought us worship this morning. Thank you. But, but you know, they, they leave their stuff on the platform, so there was no place here to pace, and I'm a pacer, you know. So I had to come up here. There's a little bit more room up here. And I'm pacing. And I'm thinking about, Lord, you know, our Father, our Father, all our, which are in heaven, hallowed, hallowed, set aside above any other name not to be spoken. In, in anything less than total reverence, uh, uh, spoken in, in a manner unlike any other name, hallowed it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will. Now, wait a minute. How does, how does his kingdom come? Uh, his power, his glory, his righteousness. And I'm thinking about some of the things I got that I, I did this week, and I thought, oh, I need to hurry and repent over them. But no, that doesn't come until later in the prayer because. He doesn't want you to immediately just go in and say, I'm sorry, God. And now, you know, I told you I'm sorry. What's wrong with you? You know, it's off my shoulders. I, I've released myself of what I've done. No. Get into first just how great God is. 
Just how wonderful God is. Oh, hallowed it be thy name, O oh Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as this. Give us this day. Give us this day, Lord. The bread of life. The bread of life that will feed this body, will encourage them, will strengthen them for, for the remainder of this year and carry them into the next year, Lord. And uh, then forgive us. Now, Father, and of course, the reason I mention it, Zechariah and Malachi, is because in Malachi especially, but both of them talk about people bringing unworthy sacrifices. Oh, you come praising me with songs, but your lifestyle. You offer to me offerings that you wouldn't offer. It says to your governors, it says, go give them those blemished sheep. You got a, you got a lamb that's blind in one eye. One thing, you know, just barely can, can make it to the altar. Oh God, here's your sacrifice. He says, oh baloney, I don't accept it. It's not reverence, it's not love, it's not an expression of how great you think I am and how greatly I have blessed you. It's an expression of how cheap you are. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm up here, you know, how can I do Oh, that's right. Father, forgive me. I may offer the only sacrifice that's acceptable to you. The blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus. Father, I put all the sins this week, this lifetime, the remainder of this lifetime, upon those for which Christ the righteousness of God. The gospel. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It is in you, in the sacrifice of Christ, that I can petition forgiveness for me, for this people. That's what a priest does, not only for his own sins, but for the sins of the people. Oh, God, forgive me. Some of them don't even know to ask you to forgive them anyway. That's what I do. That's what I do. So you think sometimes, well, you know, I forgot to ask the Lord to forgive me. Oh, that's right. But that, that preacher down there, that bratty, said he asked God to forgive us for us. Sure I do, but don't, don't neglect asking him yourself anyway. He loves to hear from you. But he forgives us through the righteousness provided through the Lamb of God, the righteousness of God in Christ. And in that, I can enter the throne room that says, Oh, my God. Not heavily laden, not carrying the weight of my sin on my shoulder and can't even hardly maneuver around, but rather boldly, God, I come to you boldly asking you. Those sins which, which bother me, that I commit, are on Christ. <coughs> and because of it, I can move forward in you. The Word of God <coughs> is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes that the work of Christ is sufficient. It's not a matter of how long it's been. How hard I strive, Lord, to not sin again. How long it's been. I made it 22 days. I made it 35 days this time, God. I made it 62 days. This, no. I've done that in my love and appreciation for you, Lord. Is, is striving to walk in your spirit, not in the flesh, but the righteousness that allows me to come is through the sacrifice of the Lamb but not a blemished lamb, an unblemished, a perfect lamb of God. Amen? Amen? First Thessalonians, Paul says, concerning the scriptures that the Lord has given him. First Thessalonians 5, 27. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all of the brothers and sisters. Read the word of God. Read the word of God to one another. Read the word of God with one another. Read the Word of God. Now, some of you, we've shared with you that you can get on your phone app or you can get on your, your computer and you can have the Word read to you. Many of you, you turn it on autopilot uh, just like you would with a lot of other things and you walk away. You go uh, prepare your meal, you go do things, and then you think, chapter 5, what happened to 2 through 4? You lost track of it even reading to you somewhere uh, in the middle of chapter one. So I encourage you, even if you're having, and I will, I'll tell you, I sit on, a, I sat in on a, the last few minutes of a, of a Bible study this morning, Sunday school class, and uh, there was a particular person, I won't mention any names, uh, was having a little bit of difficulty with some of the Hebrew names of places and people. Will join the crowd. 
Join the crowd. I tell you, you get a free pass on names and, and, and people and places. Uh, you don't all have to learn Hebrew. But I will tell you, even if you're having the scriptures read to you through your phone app, or through, read along with it. Let your eyes be following. Speak some of those words. I, I cannot personally, I cannot really go the read to me. Method. My wife and I have been reading uh, together throughout many, many, many times. If she'll turn on her app and she's reading with the app, and I've got my Bible, up. I still have to need to go back and read it afterwards. I've read it before, or I, I, I'm going to sneak out my pen because I've got to underline, I've got to circle, I've got to say, I've got to point out something to myself that the Holy Spirit has had jump off the page. If, you, if you've never had words jump off the page to you from the Holy Scriptures, pray for that. Pray that the Lord would just illuminate His Word in such a way that it's as, it's as different, some words, as the ones on the screen. Some seem like they're underlined, or some seem like they're bolded or, or highlighted. Wow, I've never seen that before. I loved it. A few weeks back now, J.J. was preaching for me. Becky and I were out of town. Thank you for the liberty to, to go every now and then. Thank you uh, for wonderful young men like these two that we have that can take the reins. Uh, but J.J. was preaching, and that week before, well, in his preparation, he came in and he talked to me. He says, hey, you know, I had never seen this before. And, and this passage, I'm going to preach on it uh, this week, but he says, I've never considered that to be literal. Literally. A real tree. Before, I thought that was just metaphorical. Just metaphorically a tree. He said, there's a real tree of life. That was for Timothy. And you know, I thought, oh man, what a little dummy, you know, 22 years old. Man, how smart I am at 60. No. I thought, wow. Isn't it neat? Any given day that you get in the Word of God, that the Word of God gets in you. In a new way. It's like a diamond. It has different facets. And however the light shines on it, you see a different brilliance, a different beauty in the Word of God. This old man sees things new all the time in the Word of God. Zechariah. Zechariah is the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. But answer in your own heart. How many of you read the Old Testament? How many of you feel like there's as much value, as much good in the Old Testament as in the New Testament? Well, I will tell you, if you do not read the Old Testament, I'm telling on you. No. I'm telling you, if you don't, you're missing out so much of the character of God. You know, kids long to find out what their parents did when their parents were their age. And so aunts and uncles come and ruin your life, right? Right? Your, your brothers and sisters come home uh, to your kids and tell your kids what you used to do when you were their age. Well, that just ruined my life. You know, I had a testimony that, that I had walked three feet above the ground for, you know, all these years. And now my... My, my daughter quizzed my brother and her uncle Paul one time, and he, he immediately answered and says, What? Are you talking about the time I. She said, That's real? That really happened? And then she named another time, and he finished it, you know. And, but we, we, you know, we're just so curious. We want to know what our parents. Oh, the Old Testament. To not know how God dealt with our parents. They're not literally your parents of this day and age, but all. Oh, of history, all of history, is advantageous for us to understand the Word of God. Many times people will quote Old Testament as if it's a promise for them, and sometimes that is not the case at all. That was a promise specifically for Israel, and unless you were there at that time going through that, then that promise isn't for you. Well, then what's the purpose in reading it? Because it goes to character. If God has always treated his people justly, always dealt out mercy in the same way, isn't it good odds that he'll continue to do that, seeing that he's a God that never changes? So it goes to character. It goes to understanding. God, Zechariah, written about 500 years 
before Christ. Zechariah's name means God remember. Now, that would be a great name for a guy that's going to tell you the word of God before the God of the word becomes silent for almost 400 years. So a little bit after Zechariah's life, God just seemingly became silent. There was no new prophecy, no new word from the Lord. Zechariah, about 500 years before, his name meaning remember, Zechariah uh, joins the older prophet Haggai in exhorting the people of God to stay the course, to finish what they were called to do. Finish building the temple. Encouraging a closer walk in obedience to God. Is that a word for us still today? Zechariah prophesied to make the glory of God known. But to let them know that the glory of God, as in former days, former to his days, cannot be realized in their day, in the temple. Here's one of those duh moments. Unless you finish building the temple. Well, duh. You can't have the glory of the Lord come down in the temple and fill the temple with the Shekinah glory of God unless you finish the temple. Oh, God, we want your spirit to fall like it did in days of old. Fill this whole... Well, there's no walls yet. And God, we haven't got a ceiling above our head. Uh, we built this foundation and we're standing on it. You know, isn't this cool, God, what we did? He says, finish the job. That's what Zachariah is mostly talking about. Finish the job of rebuilding the temple. But he sneaks in. Zechariah sneaks in some messianic prophecies. You know what messianic prophecies is? Prophecies about the coming Messiah. So he, he sneaks in. Nah. It's all throughout the Old Testament. Call it a, a thin... Uh, uh, crimson cord all the way throughout the Old Testament. Any page just about the script, you should be able to find Jesus. Well, Zechariah is no exception. He puts in there some messianic prophecy uh, speaking of the righteous branch, the triumphal entry, where he talks about the, the one who is to come will come on the colt of a donkey. Have you heard that before? Jesus on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, came riding in on the colt of the donkey, didn't he? And he talks about the betrayer of the Messiah would receive 30 pieces of silver for betraying. Now, 500 years, again, just conversations with the kids. You talk to the kids and you say, you know, I remember when I was your age, that candy bar only cost a nickel. So that now it's a buck and a quarter. <coughs> or, you know, when I was your age, I walked uphill both ways to school. Uh, when I was your age, here is a prophet prophesying 500 years before it's to come to pass. And tells you it's going to be 30 pieces of silver. Now that was either an astronomical amount of money 500 years prior, and everybody thought that's impossible. Nobody would give a person 30 pieces of silver. Or it was a low amount when it was fulfilled, or it was just a God amount that he chose him and proved that he could be God and do exactly what he said he could do. Now, the whole thing with writing it on a cult, is that just showing off? I mean, who in the world is going to know 500 years in advance and pass it down for 500 years that when it comes to pass, that a guy is going to come riding into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey? Well, remember, the first thing that was prophesied was the righteous branch. What lineage he would come from? We talked last week. It was either in the New Year's, uh, the Christmas Eve service or the, the Sunday service, I don't recall. But we talked a little about Matthew 1 and the lineage of of Jesus through Joseph, so that he would be of the righteous branch that would be in line to become king. Well, what does that have to do with riding in on a donkey? A reigning king back in 
those biblical days. I say those biblical days because we're living in biblical days. And as the prophecies about these days come to light, you better lift your hands and praise the Lord that you're living in biblical days, that these are foretold, that, that nothing is going to surprise God, that when things come about that shock you, scare you, the earth's shaking. I gave you one week's, one week's notification of how many earthquakes in excess of 4.0 we had about two weeks ago. It was 181 earthquakes in excess of 4.0. These kind of, and what happens when it's here that that earth shakes? Unless you realize we're living in biblical times and that what we see can be found within the pages of Scripture that would maybe terrify you make you think that things are out of control, but they're in the complete control of the sovereign God who reigns and rules. Well, in those biblical days, when at peace, a king would come riding in on a donkey. Not a stallion, not a great, I've ridden a lot of horses. I rode horses in California, out on the beaches in San Francisco. I've ridden horses in Alaska. I've ridden horses all over. And, and most of the time, I look and I size them up and I want the best looking, the biggest, strongest looking horse. Because man, this little guy, if he can sit that high up on a big horse, he'll look better. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't wear the cowboy boots, just in case you guys bring a horse. find its completion in Christ and in the Word. It's important. It's important. He goes on to blessings are contingent. Zechariah emphasizes that blessings from the Lord are contingent upon people's obedience to God and His Word. Relevant? Literally relevant today. God is the same. His blessings are still contingent. Now, the nice part about it is, oops, I failed, but Jesus didn't go. And therefore, I received the blessings of Christ and God. Amen. Malachi. Malachi, the very last book of the Bible, written about a little over 400 years before Christ. Malachi means messenger. Last one for a long time. Listen up. Not going to hear another word. Be desolate in the land for many years. Once again, the nation has fallen into a wide variety of sin. Divorce. Have you thought about that lately? Not divorcing. <laughs> Hopefully not. If you do, come see me. Then we talk you through it. If God sees that as a sin, it actually says in Malachi that he hates divorce. And I can tell you for many, many years as a therapist, I did divorce recovery groups. And I would start off with, you know that the scripture says, and many of them, if any of them had any biblical, had a whole lot of people that never had any church at all, they'd come to those groups too because I, I, I put it forward as growing through divorce rather than going through divorce. It's still a time to seek the Lord and grow, and, and it's a time to learn more about yourself and all that. But I'd ask, how many of you have ever heard, and most people would raise their hand, how many of you have ever heard that God hates divorce? They'd raise their hand, maybe. Why do you think that is? Hands all went down, things became silent because I'm at the front of the room and I didn't want to get out of your thoughts. Well, they just didn't know. God hates divorce because divorce ruins people, it tears you up. Divorce hurts people, and God loves people. God would not wish it on any. And he looks at it as a broken covenant. 
You stood before God and these people and made vows. Malachi is dealing with people on a variety of sins, divorce, intermarried with pagans, with people who do not hold the same value concerning God. He's going to go in in just a minute and talk about tithing. So let's just talk about giving for just a minute. Do you know how the person that you want to tie your life to thinks about giving? It matters. It matters a lot. What if Melanie, who loves to go on mission trips, got tied up with a guy that she loves and thinks I'm going to go forward in life with him? But, man, I'd rather do fun things like beach trips and cruises, but to give money to go to a, a country where people don't even speak your language, you, don't, you, you struggle the whole time you're there, you don't eat right, you, you get sick, you, you have all kinds of issues. So let's go do all the fun stuff. But no, I don't want any of our family resources going towards suffering in order to bring the gospel. Did you, and I'm picking on Melanie because she's the one who's been on the most mission trips, I think right now in this church. Thank you. But don't give them up for some guy that only wants fun and, and pleasure and, and excitement. Tithing? Now I know many of you will say that tithing is an Old Testament thing. You won't find it in the New Testament. I will tell you that any rule you find in the Old Testament, it's, it's ramped up in the New Testament. It's ramped up in the New Testament. The Old Testament says don't look at a woman. Or no, don't commit adultery with a woman. The New Testament says, don't even look at her. Don't even look at her. Right? Now, I didn't have you know, a legal pad out, but when my wife and I were dating, there was an interview process. You know, second date. We went out first date as a date. The second date we went on was at a food shelter where we served food in Alexandria. Next thing I know, we're looking at a mission trip. We talked about our giving before we were ever married, before we were ever serious. We talked about our desire and how it shaped our giving. Now, our, my kids, my kids don't have any idea how much their mother and I give. They just know that I talk to them. And hear them, well, maybe I thought, Literally, this could be my last. I had bone cancer and tuberculosis, and the type of cancer I had is that you probably won't make it. And I told them the things that are most important in life is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. As Micah 6.8 says, uh, He has shown the old man what is good, and that is to do justly, to treat people right, to love mercy because you're going to fail. And to walk humbly with your God. And the only thing I added to that advice, if I die tomorrow, catch this, kids. Live generously. Live as generous people. I can tell you that my wife and I agreed on that before we were ever married. To be good givers. And there have been years that we have been blessed to give more than we've made. I said, not more than has come in, but more than we have earned by paychecks. And it's a blessing. And you know, Micah here says, oh yeah, and you neglect tithing. He says, that's robbing from God. It belongs to him. Giving back in an expression of I love you is ramped up in the New Testament. And it's the only place in the scripture where you will see, test me, God. God say, test me. The devil came and told Jesus, well, test God. Throw yourself down because it says he's going to make sure you don't fall. Do this because he said, Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. But here, the only place in scripture where God says, test me and see. If I will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings, beyond what you're able to receive.
Test me. I say, test me with your marriages. Test me with your covenants. Test me. Mikey goes on to talk about the sins of apathy. Mikey goes on to talk about the judgment that is to come. Key words in Mike are prepare people to do what is right. To tithe. Quit robbing God. Remember God's victories of the past because you will need that knowledge to get through today. Giving to God is a privilege. Serving the Lord is a privilege. And Micah, the last book of the Old Testament, the only book of the prophets that ends not not with a promise of redemption, but a curse. The very word curse is the last one in Micah. Let's go on to look at uh, Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the word. The words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart when it is written. What is written in it. It calls the time is near. Psalms 119, verses 4 through 6. I gain understanding from his precepts, from the rules, the regulations, the, the better way of life to do things, concepts that are written within the Word of God. As we read concepts of a better way to live, and not all of those are promises that if you do this, this will absolutely happen, but Lifestyle. If this is the way we treat one another, love one another. For God has loved you. Treat one another as you would have them to treat you. That doesn't mean, that's not a promise that means that if you treat somebody like you would have them treat you, you will necessarily be blessed by them for it. Some of them will still kick you when you're down. But it's a concept that overall works better. It's a better way to do life. I gain understanding from his precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Any way other than the Lord's way, I am to hate, I'm to despise, I'm to, I'm to oh, if I had done it God's way. Oh, I wish I would have seen and understood and known the way God would have had me to deal with that. Or, you know, I knew the way and I let my tongue out of the gate too quickly and I had already popped off with a wisecrack before I popped off with a blessing from the Lord. 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and I confirm it and I will follow your righteous Lord. The Lord of God. This is the right way to live. God is the power of God and the salvation to those who believe. Psalms 119 verse 11 I have hidden your word that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart. Your heart is the engine of your soul. Your heart is, is, is the place where concepts take form and work their way out. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelations 22, verses 18 through 21, paraphrase, God's final word concerning his word is don't mess with my word. Keep it. Don't mess with it. Keep it. For I'm coming soon. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. So be it. Let's read the word. Beginning in verse 18. 
I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything, they get plagues. If anyone takes anything, they don't get to share in the tree of life, which is in the holy city. Let's read it. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes a takes words away from this scroll of the prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming. Don't be fooled. Don't think it's been 2,000 years. Things are just going to continue to go on as they've always gone on before. Don't get to thinking that it's okay. That which is evil is good in my sight. And that which is good is evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's okay. It's not okay. I'm coming soon. He says. And he who testifies of these things says, I'm coming soon. Amen. So be it. Let it be established in your minds is what amen means. So be it. Come. Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus will be with God's people. Amen. Praise the Lord. The word must be handled seriously. Let me encourage each of you. You can go online and see our plan on uh, online to get through the Bible in a year, or you can find multiple plans. They're out there. You don't have to follow the same one. The neat part about following the same one is. Any given day, somebody talks to you about their readings that day. Oh, I read that same thing. And you're ready to talk about it. You're ready to discuss it, to openly discuss what you received from the Word of God. But the Word must be taken in. And then let me finish with this. John 5, 39 through 40. The reason, the reason for the us taking in the Word of God because it reveals the God of the Word. You study, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees who are just so far gone, so far gone in their motivations and in their, their understanding. You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Jesus says, yet you refuse to come to me. You know, most of us would admit we sin. If we use a word like, I've fallen off the wagon. You know, uh, I, was, I was in a pattern maybe of doing things better, more correctly. I was doing things in a manner that my heart feels better that way. Uh, I feel like it pleases the Lord more for me to live that way. But I've fallen off the wagon. That's not just a term for alcoholics or something. But that, that says most of us would admit that we fall off the wagon. But let me tell you something. The difference between falling off the wagon and staying on the ground face down is usually the Word of God. If you are committed to reading the Word of God every day of your life. And you say, Lord, yesterday is gone. Today is new. I am sorrowful. I am asking you to forgive me. And I receive the forgiveness knowing that it's already been paid for in Christ. Encourages me to not repeat it again today. Without the Word of God, I think good people falling off the wagon just spiral further and further and further down. But when every day 
you infuse your soul, your being, in the deepest core of yourself. The Word of God. You infuse yourself with the Word of God. You say, I'm not going to get up today and repeat yesterday's mistakes. Not because it will earn me righteousness. Check your motives. If you wonder if your motives are right for reading the Word of God, check who's telling you they're not. If you if you got one one whispering on your shoulder, that, no, 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 you just want to because you you want to feel righteous and like you're somebody. Well, just forget that. Just just ask yourself what Jesus asked. Yeah. Are you diligently reading it and missing me? If that's not the case, if you're diligently reading and studying the Word of God so that you can find Him, so that you can be found of Him. Let's have our musicians come. You always stand with me. They say, I just want to ask you, you may have been reading through with me every single year for the last decade, or you may be deciding for the very first time this year to attempt. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who start reading the Bible every year and stop by January 3. Uh, this, this, yeah, January 3. But it's better if you make it all the way. If you will commit this year, whether it's your 20th time or your first time, just ask you to come and spend a moment around these altars this morning. I'm asking the Lord to help you. To help you see it all the way through. End well this year, if you've done it in 2018, but to do it again if you tear it through 2019. Right? If you have any other need of prayer, I'll be here.